What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. Okay, so as we continue our journey along the road to Justice League versus Suicide Squad, which by the way is so good, it's such a good story, we really pick up with like the Justice League prelude. And it's kind of ironic that the DC is doing this because this focuses almost entirely on Maxwell Lord. And the reason why I say it's kind of ironic is because one of his most notable moments was his death, which is actually kind of messed up. Like the greatest moment of Maxwell Lord's entire publication history was when he died. <laughs> That's pretty messed up. But it was actually Wonder Woman who broke his neck. And it was this idea that like, like the Justice League doesn't kill so it's like man like she broke his neck but it was a really cool moment for his character however maxwell lord goes all the way back to 1987 i think and he was introduced as this character that was similar to like superman's lex luther but the issue is that lex luther is very much a superman villain like that that's really and i mean he may go against the justice league from time to time but at the end of the day his bread is buttered in the superman comics and so because of that uh, dc really wanted kind of like a, a lex luther-esque character that they could fan out into the rest of uh, of the dc lineup specifically Justice League, because keep in mind, the Justice League as we knew them, that is to say, as we know them right now, uh, after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, that went away. It was Justice League International, and so you had Batman, you had Guy Gardner, you had more of an amalgamation of superheroes whose comics just couldn't sell, couldn't really stand on their own, and so they were all just kind of thrown into this Justice League International team, and then DC really just kind of decided who got a solo series and who didn't, based on the popularity of characters through write-ins and different things like that, and so they got spun out into their own series, those who were popular, and, and so on and so forth, but Maxwell Lord was originally in introduced as this guy who was the son of a really wealthy businessman. Uh, his father ended up dying and he and his mother were just kind of left to, to pick up the pieces. But his mother was very cruel, taught him to be very cruel. And the result was that he had uh, more or less created, or I guess kind of uh, became a benefactor of Justice League International uh, for the purpose of really just being a bad guy. <laughs> now, eventually this was this was changed up during the uh, Keith Given and JMD Mateus time when they wrote Justice League International. And the idea was to basically go back and say, well, that wasn't the real Maxwell Lord. I mean, it was, but he was basically under under somebody else's control. He was under the control of like a, a computer system or something along those lines. And so what happened was they kind of retconned his character to the point that once he was back into his normal self, once he was no longer being influenced by anybody, he was basically trying to come to grips with all the things that he had done. Now, this again was changed later on down the line when he was more or less turned into kind of like a robot. You know, when he had basically died, he was brought back as a cyborg. Eventually that was retconned out. And so his character went through all kinds of different changes. But the great thing about DC Rebirth, and this, this is why I love DC Rebirth so much, is it's you don't need to know the whole history of Maxwell Lord. And the reason why you don't need to know is because this comic tells us, which is cool. This also gives us like the hardcore Amanda Waller. And, and I'm really hoping that between the Suicide Squad prelude for Justice League versus Suicide Squad in this video, you guys will walk away with a good idea of why people loved the pre-New 52 Amanda Waller so much, why she was so like cold-blooded and cold-hearted. Something else that I hope you also notice here is that the, the Amanda Waller as she designed here is very similar. She really holds a lot of similarities with the Amanda Waller from a Suicide Squad movie because that was a really ruthless version of her character as well. But what this does is this initially picks up at a uh, at a Task Force X black site. Now, something to keep in mind is there are, the, you know, these things are everywhere. I mean, Amanda Waller has spots all over the place. She's kind of like this uh, this allegory to Marvel's Nick Fury. I don't remember which one came first. I want to say that Nick Fury came first. I want to say that Amanda Waller was a post-Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, character. Now, I have a video on her where I think it explains her history, but I just don't remember off the top of my head. But much like Nick Fury, Amanda Waller has these secret bases everywhere so that if it, if it really hit the fan, you know, if things really popped off, she'd have a safe place to go to. But what she's doing here is she's interrogating Maxwell Lord. Now, the reason why this matters and the reason why DC did this with regards to DC Rebirth is because in the New 52, Maxwell Lord came back. He was there, but he was part of this eight issue Omec series limited run and Omec dealt with like this weird robotic thing, uh, but it was canceled almost immediately after it started. I mean, it was, it was gone within a year. It was one of the first casualties of the New 52 because when the New 52 first started, all anybody cared about where the top heroes and that's usually how it goes like you know dc does a great big huge relaunch and everybody's like justice league superman batman you know nightwing so on and so forth and in the smaller stories like omec people just forget and it just kind of gets canceled because nobody's buying it and so because of that uh, a lot of people were going into the new 52 and didn't know that maxwell lord was there they were like i wasn't aware that he was there i mean sure he had a little bit of a hand in spiral different things like that but on the whole most people weren't aware of the fact because if you weren't reading nightwing you had no clue what was going on and so because of that uh, this kind of gives us a refresher now the cool thing is amanda waller's basically 
basically talking to him and saying, hey, look, you know, we're essentially going to go, going to run over your profile. And that's really what she does. You know, she talks about the whole profile, the kinds of things that Maxwell Lord had become a part of. Now, one of the cool things is he was also part of an organization called Checkmate. Now, I want to say that myself and Cape Joel on YouTube, I want to say that we had a discussion. We were talking about this, and I believe he said that Checkmate was part of the new 52. I don't quite remember, but Checkmate was really like DC's version or really kind of like a comparison to DC with regards to the Hellfire Club from Marvel. Of course, the Hellfire Club showed up in 1980. Uh, Checkmate was introduced in 1988, so they're about eight years apart, but they're very similar in terms of how they're structured, rather, in the sense that uh, the Hellfire Club and Checkmate both have their members based on chess pieces, the White King, the Black King, you know, the, the White Queen, the, the Black Queen, so on and so forth. The difference is that Checkmate uh, is an organization that kind of operated behind the scenes, and it was really designed more for, not really a peacekeeping force, but more like a Black Ops group. That is to say, you know, they'd go out and carry out these Black Ops missions, whereas the Hellfire Club was more of an organization bent on world domination by manipulating governments and so on from behind the scenes. But this really seemed to be, uh, it wasn't really the first meeting with regards to Maxwell Lord, but it is an introduction here with regards to the fact that he and Amanda Waller had previously met before. But it's also DC showing us how ruthless Amanda Waller is in the sense that as soon as Maxwell Lord, you know, touches her, she punches the hell out of him and says, no one touch me. It, it doesn't matter who you are. Now, again, this is really DC kind of saying Amanda Waller is hands off metaphorically in the sense that she's very disconnected from humanity. I mean, Amanda Waller's cold. She's ruthless. She's probably never had a boyfriend in her life. I mean, she's just very disconnected from society, but it also makes her somebody that you really want to have in your corner because she has access to uh, access to resources and to different, you know, governmental agencies that almost no one else has access to. And so because of that, we really just kind of, uh, we kind of backtrack a little bit and we actually pick up with the, really with the early life of, uh, of Maxwell Lord. Now, again, the reason why DC is doing this is because DC wants us to have a good idea of how his life started, you know, in terms of how he set, he was set down this path of becoming the man he is today. Now, the ironic thing about all this is that the way that this is initially open, let's say like the way, the way that it's initially told, uh, really by Tim Seeley is he kind of walks this line where it's like, well, maybe, you know, his father was the bad guy in the sense that his father was basically, you know, creating, or I guess he was really involved in pharmaceuticals. And then it turned out that some of the, uh, some of the pills that he was basically selling or pandering out to people caused cancer. And so because of that, it sent his entire company into a tailspin. Uh, it ultimately collapsed in its entirety, but basically it's his mom. Who's the bad person. You know, his mom comes along and says, look, you know, if your father had listened to me, I could have swept all this under the rug. I could have made all this go away. I could have had those people who had information. I could have had the whistleblowers killed. I could have kept all this quiet and no one would have known what was going on. I could have silenced the families whose family members died of cancer. You know, whether we paid them off, whether we had them killed, whatever the case may be, she's ruthless and cold blooded. But more so than that, she basically tells Maxwell Lord, your father was a coward. Your father was weak. And because of that, you cannot be weak. You cannot be weak. You cannot be lame. You cannot be pathetic. You have to be every bit as cruel and ruthless as I am. And the reason why is she says, there are people out there who have power that don't deserve it. Your father was a perfect example of it. She says, if you find people out there who have power and they don't deserve to have that power because they can't control it or because they don't know how to use it properly to basically benefit their own ends, then you need to strip them of that power. Now from here, we transition to some of the, the escapades of Maxwell Lord. This isn't wildly important uh, with regards to the whole Justice League versus Suicide Squad event, but it is important with regards to Maxwell Lord as a character, because what we learn is that he really took his mother's words to heart in the sense that he became part of uh, became part of Checkmate. He also served alongside a guy by the name of uh, Black King, or I guess Jason Cameron, and the two of them had essentially gone on a mission. And the result here was that, you know, was really Maxwell Lord kind of manipulating him. Now, this is where DC begins to kind of get into the powers of his character, because originally Maxwell Lord was just a guy who had no abilities. You know, he was just your average, normal human being. Eventually, what had happened is DC launched a story called Invasion. Of course, you may know this from the Supergirl, uh, Green Arrow, Flash, Invasion crossover event. But in that story, there was basically a gene bomb that had been activated and it had woken up or given metahuman powers to people who didn't previously have them. Now, it was really just kind of DC's way to try to reinvigorate interest in Maxwell Lord, try to make him a little more intriguing. It didn't really work on the whole, but in terms of like his character and what he was capable of, it did give him the ability to basically influence the minds of other people. Now, DC has danced around this historically. There's been stories where he has flat out telepathy and he can just take over the minds of other people. There have also been stories where he just subtly influences them. DC seems to be going with the more grounded approach here and saying that he basically influences people. He doesn't really control their minds. He really just kind of influences them. But then later on, it'll look like DC is kind of modifying this with some bolstering to his power. And we'll get a little more into that once we get into like Justice League versus Suicide Squad, because his powers will be expanded on in that story in terms of how they grow, as well as how he modifies them to make himself more powerful in the event. Uh, but what he does is he's basically talking to James Cameron 
Cameron, not James Cameron, <laughs> Jason Cameron, and uh, he's really kind of giving him a hard time, you know, by simply saying, hey, everybody around here says you're fearless, man. Everybody around here says you're a guy that's just not to be trifled with. And he says, but I think the reason why you're really like this is because on the inside, you're a coward and you can't stand to kill yourself. Instead, you want to die. You want all of this to go away. You want, you want your life to end, but you can't do it on your own. Instead, you want to die a hero's death. You want someone out there to, to take you out, you know, as you're like the last gun blazing, you know? And so really, he seems to hit home on, uh, on, on Jason Cameron and really just kind of sends him fleeing. I mean, just sends him like in an emotional shock. And that's really seems to be the end of, of Jason Cameron. But what we learn is the reason why Maxwell Lord did this is because his goal was to get into Checkmate and to basically rise through the ranks. And that's what he was doing with regards to Jason Cameron. Jason Cameron was the top guy. And the best way to get rid of him wasn't to just shoot him in front of everybody because then everybody at Checkmate probably would have turned against him. They would have kicked him out or they probably would have just executed him on the spot. Instead, it was essentially to just run off anybody who was in his way. And Jason Cameron manipulating his mind like that, more or less creating ideas in his head as well as feeding off these deep-seated ideas that he already had, uh, really just kind of created a situation where Maxwell Lord could continue rising up through what was referred to as the royal family. Not only that, he did that to almost all these people who were in his way. You know, a woman by the name of Alma Pardo, a guy named Couture Hobisanyo, I think is how you pronounce it. The list goes on and on and on. Anybody who was in his way, he basically turned against them. Now, this is where things start to take a different approach. And this is where DC invokes the new 52. And that's why I really like about this is because, you know, it's really kind of saying, it's really DC sitting down up to this point and saying the pre-New 52 origin of Maxwell Lord as he was originally introduced after Crisis on Infinite Earths, that's the origin of his character right now with regards to DC Rebirth. But what they say is they also kind of draw on this checkmate concept from before the New 52 and they say, okay, now that we're here, when the New 52 first kicked off, Justice League Volume 1 dealt with the Earth being invaded by Darkseid. Now, what she says is that as part of Checkmate, the goal of Maxwell Lord was to basically become a really, you know, kind of move the organization to being at the very top to the point that it was intertwined in all these governments across the world. The problem with this was that the rise of Maxwell Lord in the New 52 coincided with the emergence of superheroes. The, uh, the original formation of the Justice League as it happened in Justice League Volume 1 in the New 52. And so because because of that, uh, his 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 progress was basically hindered with the arrival of metahumans with Superman, with Green Lantern, Cyborg, Wonder Woman, Batman, Aquaman, so on and so forth. With those guys coming together and forming the Justice League, the government's, uh, really the US government, cast Maxwell Lord and Checkmate aside and said, okay, let's go ahead and introduce Argus. Now, for those of you guys who are not familiar, Argus basically means Advanced Research Group Uniting Superhumans. And this was formed to basically be a liaison between the government of the United States and the Justice League. So that the government could basically give Justice, the Justice League information they wouldn't normally be able to, to gain on their own. Now, Amanda Waller was essentially the go-between. She was put in this position. So the US government went to Amanda Waller and said, you are basically going to be the head of Argus. You're going to be the one that's the liaison to the Justice League because of all the resources and all the contacts that you have, especially when it comes to gaining information from members of the criminal underworld, because remember, there's the whole Suicide Squad thing going on under her watch. Uh, they basically say, you can give the Justice League information that they couldn't get because that information only comes from criminals and the Justice League just isn't able to pull that information out of them. And so because of that, you know, where she's basically taunting Maxwell Lord and saying, hey, you've essentially just failed. I mean, this is really where you are now. You're a guy who was eventually caught. You were brought in here, you know, and I'm just kind of, you know, grabbing this information as best we can. We don't really know exactly what Amanda Waller's whole goal is here. Uh, ultimately, uh, what happens as Maxwell Lord just begins to use his power on Amanda Waller and say, hey, wouldn't it be so easy for you to just basically give this all up? Wouldn't it be so easy for you to just let this burden go, you know, to let all these things go away? Now, the reason why I say this ties directly into Justice League versus Suicide Squad is because in that storyline, in that, that limited series, Maxwell Lord is essentially looking for an artifact. And, you know, really Amanda Waller seems to be the only one that knows where it is. Because again, keep in mind, she has access to all these things that no one has access to, or at least, you know, bits and pieces here and there. She's like the uniting factor. So she can take information from one source and information from another source and from another source after that. And so she basically holds all the keys. She's the gatekeeper for almost all the intelligence uh, organizations with regards to the entirety of the DC universe. So because Maxwell Lord is essentially trying to track this item down before we get too far into it, I mean, he's told it's basically in the basement of Belle Reve, but before we get too far into it, uh, we basically have Amanda Waller resist his mind control. Now, this is such a huge deal for her character. This is massive because 
because Maxwell Lord even says no one's ever done that before. No one's ever resisted his mind control before. Now, again, his ability to control minds is going to be a huge part, especially when, uh, well, I'm not going to spoil that, but especially when we get into the story itself. But again, this is really just DC saying, hey, look, this is what Amanda Waller is capable of. This is how dangerous she is. Now, when you combine that with the idea of her really, you know, launching the, the first Justice League, you know, really kind of launching the first Justice League team, it creates a really dangerous situation. And the reason why I say that is because Maxwell Lord essentially uses his abilities or his powers on these soldiers, you know, who were brought in there to essentially stop him from attacking Amanda Waller. And so basically he uses them to engineer his escape. Now, the funny thing about this is Amanda Waller doesn't really step in to do anything to stop him. And the reason why is because what can she do? I mean, Maxwell Lord can control the minds of, a, well, not really control, but he can influence the minds of a lot of people. If she were to call like the Justice League and say, hey, Maxwell Lord is out there, keep in mind, no one knows who Maxwell Lord is in the Justice League, except for the pre-New 52 Superman, just because of the fact that he was around, you know, when Maxwell Lord was originally there. And, and actually the whole situation with him and Maxwell Lord gets super cool in Justice League versus Suicide Squad. But in any event, you know, with him making his escape, of course, he basically makes a promise to his mom, you know, I'm going to basically grab, you know, the original Suicide Squad as Amanda Waller had put it together. I'm going to bring them together and we're basically going to complete my mission. Again, the purpose of the story is really just designed for DC to say, here is who Maxwell Lord is. Here's what Maxwell Lord is about. And the reason why they did that, again, I probably should have mentioned this at the very beginning, but the reason why they did that is because when Justice League versus Suicide Squad picked up, the ending reveal of the first issue was Maxwell Lord was back. Well, the problem is there were a lot of people who were reading that. They were like, who the hell is Maxwell Lord? So <laughs> it creates a really easy situation to kind of segue in, at the very least to have an understanding about who he is. But the cool thing about this is Maxwell Lord is a big player in the realm of DC. He's one of these guys where it's not like he's one of the most dangerous supervillains in the world, but he is certainly a villain that if he's written correctly, he will always be there. He will always be in the background. He's a guy that will just keep coming and coming and coming. And that's why fans love him so much. You know, he's like a Lex Luthor for the Justice League. And so it creates a really, really cool situation uh, with regards to, you know, how he how he acts in accordance with the, the main superhero community. But uh, Justice League versus Suicide Squad will start this week. And I'm very excited about that because it's a really, really, really good story. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and leave a comment down below. Let me know. Uh, what do you guys think about Maxwell Lord? I mean, I've thought about doing like a full character explanation on him. It's really one of those things where it's, it's not like it's anything that anybody would ask for. I don't know very many people who would be like, I really want to know about Maxwell Lord. He's intriguing, but really everything we need to know about him will be covered in Justice League versus Suicide Squad. I mean, it's really just kind of a fresh start with his character and we'll learn about him as other members of the Justice League learn about him. So again, that's kind of the cool thing about Rebirth is it gives us a really good jumping off point for a lot of the characters who are being reintroduced to DC Comics. But uh, with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.